<clears throat> Perfect. Thank you very much. Same procedure as every year. Um, a little bit, the title is Structural Thoughts on the Ecosystem. Um, there have been thoughts about um, the hubs which have clearly materialized. There have been thoughts on financing that has materialized. But I think I would like to shift the focus a little bit on a different topic because I think there is from now on more at stake than there was the years before. The years before up to now, the internet built companies that didn't exist before. And I think from now on, the internet will interfere with businesses that did exist before, meaning putting a very substantial risk to all the, for example, 1,500 world market leaders in German Mittelstand that are scattered all over Germany. So my perception is that um, there is a really decisive moment where we um, distribute the wealth of Europe, whether we take advantage of helping these companies to get also on the digital train or if, if we miss out, miss out on that. Um, at the same time, um, oh, so what does it need? I think it needs a little bit on the tech investments and exits because I would also like to look at exits as a structural prerequisite to an ecosystem. We haven't ever talked about that. We saw always look at the big exits um, that are in the headlines, but they are only a very tiny part of the purpose that M&A and exits have. Um, the second is that there have been new financing um, models which um, ar 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 arose, and they give you new chances and new risk. And thirdly, I still would like to advocate that we again need hubs in the ecosystem, but a different kind of hubs. So let's dive into it. So quickly through some numbers, I mean, it was predicted numbers of investments will rise and they have risen consistently. Same here for the 100 million plus financing rounds. Also, they have been um, gradually uh, expanding and the great number of unicorns that everybody is uh, reflecting to. In my last speech last year, there was one chart which I still is pretty valid and that the perception of too expensive rounds, of too much in the news, how big have these rounds been, was driven by um, not the A, B, C rounds, it was majorly driven by the D rounds, where players like the Fidelities went in with huge sums, and what we now can see, and what was already at that time discussed last year, is that it is a total misperception of a financing, because mostly on the very large side, they have special caveats that make them profit whenever it is and make them being independent from the valuation they pay. So that's why you have seen very high valuations at the D round level that at some points have, been, have not been achieved at IPOs or in M&A deals. Um, um, these ones, they also come with some risks that some people do not see. It's always nice to say, okay, I got so much money in at such and such valuation, and, um, and, and you tend, especially as the founder, to be very proud of it and to calculate yourself rich, but there are implicit risks which I would like to uh, demonstrate at some point in time. Let's see, we have a series E round at a two billion valu uh, valuation, and one of the T rows and fidelities, or the, the big guys, they put in 250 million at a, at a two billion valuation. Of course, they have a one time liquidation preference, and since they can, since the founder is so keen to have that much money at such high valuation, he says, I'm also willing to accept an anti dilution. So, what happens now then? At this moment, you have 25% founders, 62% normal financiers and the last series A is 12.5%. So now, since it was an artificial high valuation and the market sobered down a little bit, um, the exit can only happen at 1.5 billion valuation. So what happens? Through these kind of anti-dilution and participatory liquidation preference, the series E guys always make their money. 
So they are totally independent of valuation. So that's my message. The largest high valuations, they have to be taken with a certain portion of cautiousness. And what the founders do, and this is my main message to the founders, be careful, do not be vain, don't fall for these larger rounds because there's a great risk that you deleverage yourself. Uh, because if you then get a lower valuation and these guys get the anti-dilution protection and the liquidation preference, you deleverage yourself to very small, um, the smaller um, equity stakes than anticipated. So, um, but you can also play it in a, in, a, in an advantageous role if you don't take so much money at a later stage. And there even have been some companies that specialize of having, especially for family offices, a certain financing instruments where you can do uh, smaller checks with, uh, with the same mechanisms. I have, uh, there's even one company doing it that has been brought to my attention by my family office. So if everybody's interested from the family side to learn more about that, he can write me an email on that one. Um, so what else can we see? So we have large exits, but last year was way more than this year. So the, the likelihood uh, and the one billion uh, venture back exits has, call, has called down. So that brings us to a little bit to the exit environment. And the exit environment is, is an interesting one. So I want to distinguish the M&A deals by value and by count. So the value, you clearly see that in 2014, 71% of the value was driven by the big IPOs, which everybody reads about that drive the, the craziness of the market. In 2015 already, this has shrunk a little bit to 53%, but the interesting thing are the 5%, the 3% to the 5%. This is the, the area which I like to focus on. That is not something where my A&A guys get excited about with the big deals, but I think that is the part that drives an enormous uh, value for the ecosystem because by count, it's 55%. It's 55% of the exits happen at a median at around um, 70 million. So what does it mean and why do I think it's important? I think this is the structural M&A part of an ecosystem that we didn't have so far. Uh, and let's see why. In the US, uh, um, Google, uh, Apple did an acquisition every month. Google in the la bought 55 companies over the last 24 months. So only 2.5% make it. So that means in 24 months, they look at 2,200 companies, which is 90 per month. So meaning we have to, to be aware that M&A is an integral, integral part of how we build the ecosystem and how we build the companies in a different way. Facebook, same story. What does it mean? In the US, they get it. So most of these structural M&As happen in the US. The EU, it's interesting, EU, EU, EU and UK and Canada also get it to some extent, which I think is because here the culture of shares of stock market is a little bit more progress than in, in, in Germany, for example. I will get to that a little bit later. Um, here again, Germany is totally losing out here. Here is the interesting number. The number of M&A deals in relation to GDP. So in average, you have 80 deals per trillion US dollar GDP. And those companies and there's those markets where you have a culture of stock market or financial markets, they get it. And they do have a lot of M&As because they use shares as a currency. When they look at the scenery, they say, okay, what, what can I gain, what can I lose if I buy a company with stocks and I swap this? Um, in Germany, we, we, there, a share is a securitization of ownership. They, it's not a payment currency. So this is something where a shift in thoughts needs to, need to happen. So you clearly see it here in the most active structural acquirers, companies that did these kind of M&As. The red ones are Europeans, and you see we are nowhere. Yeah. So what I want to say with this is everybody else, especially the US, use structural M&A as a way to accelerate the development of a company. Uh, so and 
that's very clear. They do it for totally different purposes. Uh, and my reason, what I want to say <clears throat> is that I think the biggest reason for that is that the U.S. structurally thinks different. Uh, so we are always cautious. When we say, oh, yeah, the Spotify and oh, Airbnb and Klarna, so many unicorns, is the valuation justified? Uh, so the, the total valuation is 457 billion of these 127 unicorns. And now I would want to ask you, would you rather have as your retirement fund 127 unicorns in your portfolio or Microsoft? Yeah? So I think the perception with which you look at sceneries drives everything how you conclude these kind of things. So back to the M&A market. What does it mean in the M&A market? Here is the reason why people do structural M&A. And the number one reason, and forget nearly all the others, is innovation, R&D talent, tech talent. And now let's shift that to, to Germany. I think the German Mittelstand needs to desperately look at this that way. And there's no way that you will have an innovation, a company, uh, the Mittelstand's company, also the Mittelstand for the UK or for France, nobody of the tech talent will go to Wuppertal or I don't know where. Uh, so I think you need to buy these companies and then put them into certain hubs. So here again, it is about talent. It is about accelerating and driving the shift of your current business with new, fresh talent. So the same reason here, we buy it for smart people. We buy it for smart people, second market. We buy it for smart people. We buy it for smart people. Um, <clears throat> and now the funny one. Yeah, so let's compare a Google that co incorporates this kind of thinking with a German Mittelstand. The German Mittelstand has 600 million asset value. The average age of an employee is 53 years old in comparison to Google 29. So the good thing, what they have in common, probably the employees both wear diapers. The Google ones because they're young and the German Mittelstand guys, they are so old. Yeah? So they do the German Mittelstand 0.1 acquisitions per year and Google did 27. So we need to understand it is not about something which you can calculate. That's not something where your Wirtschaftsprüfer and your auditor has to say, oh, that is very nice in terms of your all like a balance sheet. It is about getting people you wouldn't otherwise get. And here is the a, is a next analogy. I did a research, or, uh, and Olli Heimes from, from our Lexta team helped me on that one, is if you do not embrace technical innovation in your company, you probably will lose two to two and a half percent of operating profit from year to year. If you scale that over six years, that means you will anyways lose 12% of your company in value. So <clears throat> that means if you lose anyway 69 million, I don't think that you have anything to lose. Take the 69 million and do equi hires in order to um, import these people and get them into your ecosystem and help them drive, drive chances. So with something like 69 million, you have a shot at like, something between five and 10 or 15 young startups that can be acquired, that can be brought into your company, can challenge everything that is there and help you um, convert into that. I think there has been a great example of a company that is trying that. Um, Air Berlin is uh, currently losing, I think, a million a day. Uh, so in order to totally shift, the only way how they could do it, and they've really successfully done it, is take everybody out, get into a hub, which in this case was the factory in Germany, and then get with a very broad team totally beefed up. So the mindset has to change. And what I want to convey with this message is that structural M&A is a great way to ammunition yourself against it, and I don't think anybody has anything to lose. Uh, if you are a middle-stand guy, you don't invest from your family office in tech, you are bust, and if you don't integrate tech in your normal company, then, then you're bust as well. So some <coughs> key takeaways. Um, um, <coughs> there is no alternative to getting fresh talents into the company. 
Um, there have to be structural M&A deals, but you need to also at the same time prepare yourself to, to judge accordingly. And for a lot of people that and companies in Europe or in Germany that are very right, or in UK as well, which are widely distributed, they don't have a chance. If you're sitting in Aschaffenburg or Nuremberg or, or wherever, there is no one who challenges you in your daily life to, to, to think differently. So that's why I think we need to think about different hubs. We need to think about hubs in Europe where um, established companies can go put some people and get the spirit of the new economy and then transform it into their life uh, and their company. So that's why I, as a long-term supporter of um, the ecosystem, uh, I'm very happy to always uh, have an interchange with Marco on these structural things. And that's why I invested in the factory, because I think it is a great structural place to help this ecosystem, and especially in the second wave for Mittelstand, to accelerate. And Tech City has the same character here. I think we need more of that, and I think we need to push Mittelstand and broader ones way more rigorously into that, because, as said at the beginning, it's way more at stake. It's the wealth of Europe that we need to um, rebuild or defend. Thank you very much.